Hello, welcome to week two. This video is going to serve as a bit of a historical backdrop, overall introduction to the history of American theater and where some of the practices we see today come from, where we started and where we've seen the American theater go. Theater took quite a while to get to the United States, partially because of Puritanism. The Puritans were extremely against the theater and plays, so we didn't get any sort of regular theater happening in the United States until the late 18th century. Now, when we look throughout the 19th century into the early 20th century, there were a couple of different styles of performance happening. The first one that I'm going to talk about that came pretty much the earliest is the variety show. And what the variety show looked like was basically a variety of different performing acts from singing to dancing, comedy routines, short skits. Um, we had female impersonators, magic acts, acrobatics, clowns, ventriloquists, and burlesque and strip teases. Um, where we would see a lot of this happening was in places like saloons and in music halls, rather than what we think of today as a traditional theater space. So what made these pop up in this way in particular was as we're entering the 19th century, we have the Industrial Revolution happening in the United States. We have all of these people who had previously been working with their families on farms day and night, moving into the cities to fill all of the factory jobs, and these cities are growing and growing. All of a sudden, we have all of these people in more concentrated areas, and for the first time in our history, we've got a lot of people with leisure time on their hands. So the variety show was something that was, one, easy to set up. You could have different performances every night. All you needed was some space for a stage and somewhere for people to gather. And because of the style of the variety show being rather informal, it was pretty easy to pop up and travel. Who you have in the audience is who you have with free time in these cities. Mostly we've got working class men and white men, immigrant men attending these variety shows. So based on where they were set, in our bars, in saloons, in music halls, with all of these working class guys, the variety shows got a bit of a reputation for being an attraction for drunks, for prostitutes, for general rabble-rousers. There was a lot of alcohol involved. It was seen as a very adult form of entertainment. In contrast to the variety show, we get what is called vaudeville which is a similar idea that uses a variety of forms of entertainment. However, the purpose behind vaudeville was kind of a more family-friendly alternative to the variety show, a cleaning up of popular entertainment in the U.S. Our leaders of this movement away from variety shows to vaudeville were first P.T. Barnum, Yes, same guy of the circus, greatest show on earth. He was a strong member of the temperance movement, so he was very much about um, getting alcohol out of people's hands, making family-friendly entertainment spaces. He worked with a man named B.F. Keith and E.F. Albee to organize these different circuits of performance that would host variety shows that were aimed at mostly women, children, and families. They were looking for a more middle class, a more respectable form of entertainment. And what these circuits were, 
they had the same owner of different venues in different cities. And performers would travel across the country to these different venues on the circuit. And this was becoming more and more possible with the building of railroad infrastructure across the country. Again, tying into our Industrial Revolution, the development of performance is very much tied together with our technological advancements. So individual performers in small groups were able to tour to different cities and towns, performing their acts at different theaters. Often these performers would tour about 40 weeks out of the year doing a lot of one-night-only engagements at these different venues. They might travel to 40 different cities. Our small-time performers might play to smaller houses in less populated areas for about $75 a week. But some of those who headlined the most lucrative and most popular shows, particularly around New York City, might be paid up to $1,000 each week, which in today's currency is equivalent to about $27,000. So while a lot of stage actors got their start on the vaudeville circuit, larger theaters in places like New York City put on plays in the style called melodrama. So generally, melodrama means a plot that is highly sensational and highly emotional. Um, Specifically, in this context of American theater, when we're looking at melodrama, we are going to see these sensational emotional plots. Our characters are always going to be in the most extreme of situations, um, and there's always going to be a clear moral lesson, usually a happy ending. In melodrama, we've also got several stock characters. In pretty much every story, we have the hero, the trusted friend and the faithful servant, the pure and innocent heroine, we have the villain and his accomplice. And often, these are extremely clear who these people are. In addition, we have a lot of music and spectacle. Melodramas were typically scored with incidental music and songs to help the audience know what they should be feeling at any given time. We see this still in our movie scores today. A particular subset of melodrama was called sensation drama. So this emerged with the rapidly developing technology with lights and mechanics that meant that theaters competed for the most sensational visual effects that they could come up with. And there were far fewer safety regulations, so they did some pretty spectacular things. For example, in 1867, we have this play, Under the Gaslight, in which we have... Our villain has tied the faithful servant, who is a Civil War veteran, very sympathetic character. He has taken him, tied him to the train tracks to await an oncoming train to kill him. At the last moment, our heroine, who has been locked up in this woodshed, which is for some reason full of axes, breaks her way out of the shed to swoop in and rescue the servant from the oncoming train at the last minute. So in the production itself, the theater built train tracks that could support an actual train to come through the theater for this scene to pull off this action-packed moment. Another example of this sensation drama comes to us in Dion Boucicault's 1899, The Poor of New York. So in The Poor of New York, we have three radically different sets and scenes. First, we start off, so in one act, we see the inside of the manor of this very wealthy family. The set is very detailed. We see all of their possessions. In the following act, we see a tenement building that catches fire, is set ablaze, and has to be put out. Again, far fewer safety regulations. This would not fly today. They would set the building on stage on fire every night and have to put it out. In the third act, we have a realistic replica of New York's Union Square, 
with a blizzard. So as you can imagine, this was particularly expensive to produce. So there wasn't quite as much of this happening as in the vaudeville or variety shows, which were relatively cheap to produce all over the country. The melodramas and the sensation dramas in particular were situated in larger cities where there was enough income and enough money coming in to be able to support burning a building on stage every night and building train tracks that could support an actual train to run through your theater. So all of vaudeville, variety entertainment, and these spectacular melodramas fell out of fashion in the 1930s. This is largely due to the Great Depression. Many theaters were forced to close, performers were out of work because nobody had the money anymore to pay for their leisure entertainment when they were concerned about just keeping food on the table. On the other hand, these forms of entertainment were falling out of favor because of the rise of film as a popular entertainment for the working classes that was affordable, that was much easier to get realistic and spectacular scenes if you only have to do it once. Obviously, the budgets for the sensational scenery of the theatrical melodrama were not exactly sustainable through the Great Depression. So despite the fact that these forms sound markedly different from what we see today in the theater, there are quite a few of uh, the elements that still linger with us. Melodrama, despite the unrealistic plots in its scenic design and its overall goal was to depict things realistically. And today, much of our theater deals in realism, looking at real people in real situations or realistic situations. And our vaudeville and variety entertainment is still pretty alive and well in programs like SNL. And a lot of different late night comedy programs still use a lot of the similar forms, combining sketches, stand up comedy, musical acts, things like that. So in our next lecture, we're going to dive in a bit more deeply on looking at identity in American theater. During this time, there were a lot of fascinating and disturbing things happening with gender, disability, class, and race on stage. Specifically, in the next lecture, we're going to be looking at depictions of African Americans on stage throughout American history, particularly in this early period of the 19th century.